Will you pray with me? Holy and gracious God, we seek your spirit to move in this space. And through these ancient words, we might hear your voice again. Hear it anew, speaking to us in this time, in this day and age. We pray it in your Son's name. Amen. The Psalms, I think, may be the most underrated scriptures in all of our canon. They don't have the power of the Gospels. We don't hear Jesus directly in them all the time, and they're not the old-time storytelling aspect of many of the Hebrew scriptures. And they're not Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses and the burning bush. None of that is in the Psalms. We don't build BBS around them or do a lot of the things we do with the Gospels and the Old Testament. We use them for music and for hymns, and we will do that throughout this land. And we hear them at funerals. Psalm 23 especially speaks to us of comfort and grace. But to look at them for theology or for some sort of deeper meaning, to hear a word in them that can be transformative or a voice from God, well, that's not how we tend to use the Psalms and hear the Psalms. I'm not sure I can criticize this, because after all, there is lots to hear in the Gospels, in the Epistles, in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the storytelling there that is worth hearing. And yet there's something in the Psalms that we neglect sometimes, and we shouldn't. That's why I'm focusing on them for these six sermons in this series, tonight and five weeks coming afterwards. Each week we'll look at one psalm, and as I said in the announcements, each psalm will be of one of the many types of psalms so that through the course of this series we'll hear psalms of praise, psalms of lament, many types of psalms. We begin tonight with Psalm 51. The psalm of Ash Wednesday, and perhaps the psalm that most reminds us of our need for forgiveness for God's grace. The psalm we often hear in times of that, creating me a clean heart, O God, as the psalm we have heard said. This is the psalm, if we believe tradition, that was written by David when he, after he raped Bathsheba. Well, anyway, about the Beatitudes, no, I can't. <coughs> I'm not going to go back to last year's sermon series. Um, and we're also not going to have a whole sermon on David and Bathsheba, because trust me, that story needs a whole bunch of sermon and not the psalm conversation. But I mentioned that because life's complicated, right? Life's messy. Even the psalms are messy, and while we will look at them and see what they might say to us, it's worth acknowledging that they have their messy, complicating parts. Even Psalm 51 has things about it that might be messy. And yet, and yet Psalm 51 stands as a stark reminder of both our sinfulness as human beings and of God's mercy and grace, of God's love. The reminder of our sin in Psalm 51 is very clear. The author, whether it's David after his terrible actions or something else, is not pulling many punches about himself. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me, writes the psalmist. You, God, are justified in your sentence. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner, when my mother conceived me. You won't find in Psalm 51 justification and defensiveness. The psalmist knows that they're pretty sinful, that they've messed up in big ways. They write that their sin is massive, always before them, and indeed worthy of God's judgment. They profess they're well aware of their shortcomings, that God's within God's rights to cut them off, to give punishment. To give consequences. There's hope in this psalm, and we'll get to that hope. But the psalm is rooted first and foremost in humility and an awareness of the psalmist's sin. 
As the kids that I talked about, that awareness is one of the gifts of Lent. Lent is when we pause as a church to remember our own sin. And I'm grateful for it because I need the reminder. You probably know me well enough by now that most of my sermons talk about God's love and God's grace, maybe about God's justice and the work we're called to in the world to work for a kingdom world. But I don't spend a lot of time talking about our sinfulness as human beings. I just don't. And I'm probably not going to. But Lent forces us, forces me, to have that conversation. And it's important because it's also part of who we are. From Adam and Eve all the way to now, a part of our nature as human beings is to sin. We make mistakes. We fail to live up to what God calls us to. Worse, sometimes we do so willingly. We know that we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves. We know we're called to share resources, to share our wealth, to share ourselves. We know we're called to forgive, to turn the other cheek, to see our enemies as fellow children of God, but we don't always want to. And so sometimes we just choose not to. We hoard. We hate. We say unkind words, knowing that they're unkind words. We do unloving things, knowing they are unloving actions. Because we are sinful people. We are people who do not listen to God's will and ways, who look for our own wisdom as better than God's, who sin against God and against each other. We are a sinful people who need God's grace. If we're honest, our sins, just like the psalmists, are always before us. And we know that we need the grace and mercy of God. We need that, in part, because something else we are. And that is people who want to do good. I believe that firmly. It's a phrase in seminary, um, I forget the exact phrase, it wasn't written down here. But uh, the idea of how we view human, be human beings is, is naturally sinful or naturally good or somewhere in between. And I think we human beings have some pretty bad tendencies. But I also think we want to be good. No one, it is said, is the villain in their own story. We all want to do good, right? We all want to do what's right. We want to do good. We want to be good. And the psalmist knows this about himself. They know their sin. They know that they're sinful. But they also want to be different. That indeed is the cry of the psalm. It is not just, oh God, I'm awful, please punish me. But God, transform me. God, create me a clean heart. God, make me reflect your will. God, help me to have actions that reflect what I want, which is to follow you, to love like you, to be like you. That's the cry of the psalm. That's the cry of the psalmist. They seek not just forgiveness from God, but transformation from God. Because the psalmist realized something very important. And that's forgiveness is actually not enough. Sorry is not enough. I've had that conversation with kids before, trust me. I'm sure all of you parents have had too. It's not enough to say, I'm sorry. You have to change. You have to allow yourself to be transformed. It's not enough to say I'm sorry and then go back to what you were doing in the first place. The repentance that God calls us into, the repentance the psalmist in Psalm 51 seeks, is one that leads to somewhere new. The psalmist does not just seek relief that God offers forgiveness so they can go, whew, glad that's over but makes a commitment to change, a commitment to being renewed, 
being transformed, to becoming closer every day to one who does love and care for others, who does the work of justice, who does live up to what God wants us all to be. The psalmist and us, when we pray this psalm, strives not just to acknowledge their faults, but also become a being who does what God wills, who by word and action proclaims the love and grace of God. Then the psalmist says, I will teach transgressors your ways. My tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance because I've been transformed, because I've been changed. The psalmist seeks not just forgiveness, the psalmist seeks to be transformed, to be changed. And if we would follow in the psalmist's path, then that prayer is ours as well. To be transformed by God's grace. That's our invitation and our calling. To allow ourselves this Lenten season and afterwards to be, become different than who we were before. Now, that's not easy, but we don't do so alone. For as the psalmist reminds us, we are surrounded by the love and grace of God. The God who makes all things new. The God who makes our transformation possible. Have mercy on me, the psalmist declares to God, because of your steadfast love. Your chesed is the word in the Hebrew. Have mercy on me, the psalmist says to God, because of your faithfulness. Their plea for forgiveness, for transformation, is rooted in the love of God they've already experienced, is based in the grace of God they've already come to know. They can make this cry, this plea, because of how they have known God, and they trust in it, because they have come, even within God's judgments upon them, to trust in God as the one whose steadfast love is the most defining trait. And friends, that's our promise too. Our forgiveness is assured. Our transformation is coming if we do the work. And we do not journey alone because our God is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. We can trust in forgiveness and grace and transformation because God's primary characteristic as revealed to us in the Hebrew Scriptures and in Jesus is that a steadfast love for all of God's children, including us. We are forgiven. We are renewed. We are transformed throughout the Lenten journey and all it is of our lives. Because God's steadfast love comes to us and makes it so. In the coming weeks, we will examine each psalm closely. Each psalm. Several psalms, not each psalm. That's a lot of weeks. We'll look at, look at those psalms and look how they give us language to respond to the good and challenging news that we've heard. We'll explore psalms about the king, psalms of lament, and yes, even psalms of praise. But we'll all come back to the same thing. By the grace of God, we are empowered to see our failings, to see, acknowledge, and even name our sins. <clears throat> By the power of God, we are forgiven and transformed. We are changed to become closer to the disciples we're called to be. And by the steadfast love of God, we are not alone on this journey. Not today. Not throughout Lent, not for the rest of our lives. Thanks be to God. Amen.